Hello, I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us this week on Newsmakers. Well, summer's oftentimes a quiet time on college campuses, but at Missouri Southern there's a lot happening year-round, and especially if you go by Hearns Hall where the administrative offices are. Today I'm wel welcoming our newest administrator from, from this last past winter, Brad Hodson. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, Executive Vice President and Director of the Missouri Southern Foundation. That's right. Uh, how do you answer the question if someone comes up and says, well, what do you do in that job? <laughs> well, it is a diverse job and, and lots of different responsibilities, but but to just simplify it, I, I think of when I visited my son's third grade class for career day, I said it's my job to make sure everybody loves the Lions. That's my job. <laughs> help so whether it's fundraising or alumni relations or PR and marketing and missions, we just want everyone to love the Lions. Right. Now you've been here since February, That's since right. the winter time. So a few months under the belt, getting like five, a five months That's or right. so on campus. Uh, how, how have things gone for you in the first few months here? Well, it's a little bit of a homecoming. I'm a, a graduate of Missouri Southern in 1991 with a degree in economics and finance. And there are still some faculty, one or two, that uh, still are teaching here. And so it's been nice to come back and reacquaint myself with them and to see the campus again it's it's a beautiful campus it always mm -hmm. has been uh, lots of nice folks and I've just been welcomed very warmly back to, to Missouri Southern. A little different perspective than coming back. As it is minister, yes as, oh, a as a student, student I, I don't think you understand the complexity or, or the uh, the variety of activities that are taking place and as an administrator you see all that so it is a different perspective. Now people might be curious what led you down the road initially to the business side of things economics and so forth. Well, I, I thought I wanted to be in banking like my dad, uh, and in 1991, when I graduated, was one of the great uh, little mini recessions, and, and banking wasn't uh, wasn't a good field. They weren't hiring, and so I went on to pursue a master's, and from there, really became interested in higher education administration. So, thanks to the economy, I have a career. The gig economy in 1991 <laughs> led you to I today career. have a career in higher education. So. so, and higher education, as we know, is a field that has evolved tremendously over yes. those years. Yes. Well, and and I was lucky enough in. Uh, the mid-90s to get into the advancement side of higher education, the mm -hmm. fundraising and marketing and, and uh, relationship side of higher ed, and the need for those skills has only intensified in the last two decades. And so uh, I was at the right place at the right time in the evolution of higher ed. And in higher ed across the country, not only locally or statewide, the funding situation has changed so much. I mean, it used to be as a state institution, sure. here's the money from the state. That's right. You're not facing that situation. Oh, no, today. not at all. I think that uh, I, I have great respect for my predecessors, but their world was a little bit different than the one that we inhabit. They waited for the check from the state to come, and, mm -hmm. and they set tuition at a very reasonable rate in order to make it accessible to regional students. Right. You'd never dream of, of recruiting out of state even or even nationally. Uh, uh, 40, 50 years ago, and so uh, it was a much different uh, world. They were much more concerned with student issues. Uh, we're concerned with funding issues, and, and that, that, uh, that focus has turned over the last 30 years. So um, your pie, the pieces of the pie, that state piece of appropriation has really shrunk over those right. years. Well, as the state has shifted its focus to different priorities, mm -hmm. education has had to become much more aggressive in making their case right. uh, that this is still a valuable uh, not only economic development tool, but a valuable tool to make sure you have an educated citizenry and that it's an investment in the state's future. Uh, you can produce an accounting graduate today. They will go off and get a job, but they're not going to add to the economy immediately. You're going to have to see that as a long-term investment. And, and uh, making that case before the legislature is more difficult today. It's one of my roles is, is uh, helping Dr. Marble with governmental relations. Right. And uh, legislators are pulled in many, many different directions for that shrinking piece of funding. And dealing with governmental relations, of course, you're dealing with the state, but I know you attend Joplin City Council meetings. Absolutely. There's lots of different layers of government. In there are. <laughs> well, and, and uh, community relations is wrapped in there as well, and, mm -hmm. and I think part of that is being visible, right. letting the Missouri Southern cares. We're interested in what's happening in the community. We see ourselves as a partner, and so sitting uh, uh, at um, school board meetings and city council meetings, I am listening on behalf of the institution to see if there are opportunities or issues that we need to address with those governing bodies. But a lot of times I'm there because I'm, I'm wearing the pin, I'm wearing the logo, and mm -hmm. it, we care, we're a part of the community, we're a major employer, we want to be visible and, and be partners. Right. And you see that as a two-way street, Missouri Southern wants to be part of the community, That's right. but you want the community to be part of Missouri Southern. Oh my gosh, every time I see folks I encourage them, come out to campus, come walk. We know people walk at night, mm -hmm. this campus is a beautiful place to come spend your evening and stroll, and, and uh, we do want people out here to enjoy the campus, to be part of our events and activities, cultural and academic and athletic. And so, uh, yes, every chance I get. Uh, if I could build a road uh, from campus through the mall to downtown, I'd do it right now <laughs> right. Uh, because we want that easy access. Mm -hmm. There's still that bridge they're working on to try to get across there the creek. There is, down there. And, and there's this psychological 
uh, not barrier necessarily, mm -hmm. but it does seem like, oh, I have to go all the way around. Well, really, it's just a half mile. Right, just um, the different stoplight yeah. to drive through. <laughs> but if, if we were already at the mall and we had a little bridge, it'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. So small steps. Well, I know you have a lot of areas that report to you as a vice president, executive vice president. You mentioned um, admissions and enrollment, a big job of bringing the students to Missouri Southern. Uh, right. The growth of Missouri Southern over the years has expanded beyond just, we're just a little regional That's university. Right. That's right. And now we view ourselves uh, as truly a regional uh, university, even recruiting nationally. Mm -hmm. And so we see our effort when we talk about marketing and, and uh, where our recruiters are spending their time, it's not in Jasper and Newton County as it might have been when I was a student right. here. Uh, they're in Northwest Arkansas, they're in Oklahoma, Kansas, St. Louis. Uh, one of our growing areas is Chicago. Mm. There are just so many students up there and not enough opportunities for higher ed that they're very receptive to just a quick drive down uh, I-44 uh, from St. Louis to come to Missouri Southern. And so, uh, yes, it is much more of a regional approach than it used to be. We don't quite have the staff or the budget to be a national uh, brand right. yet, but mm -hmm. trying very hard to be a very strong regional brand. I know some steps have been taken by the university in terms of tuition, the Lion Pride tuition, right. to help those out-of-state tuition. That's right, and, and we're even considering expanding it further because there are markets like Texas that have an overabundance of high school students. They are growing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's estimated in the next 10 years, Texas will increase their population by 20 percent. And so lots of high school students and their universities aren't growing at a pace to be able to accommodate all that. Well, again, just come right up I-35 to Tulsa and I-44 and, and you're here. And our price point makes us very competitive with even in-state options in Texas and, mm -hmm. and uh, other growing states like that. Do you feel that that uh, affordable tuition aspect is one oh, of the biggest strong points? Is. That and the quality of our academic programs. You mm -hmm. can be competitive from a price perspective, but if you don't have the quality academic offerings, uh, you won't get very far with that uh, conversation about coming to Missouri Southern. And so price point is important, but the next question is, what majors do you offer? Uh, how, what is your employment rate of your graduates? Are they getting jobs? And, and we have to be competitive there as well. Hmm. And of course, getting that word out falls under one or another area of responsibility, university relations and marketing. So well, you can't keep that little secret in Joplin, Missouri. No, not at all. And, and before we move on to, to university relations, I think it's important to note that it's strategic to place admissions in the division with uh, alumni relations and mm -hmm. university relations and marketing, there's a synergy there. And not that we don't work very well across division boundaries, but having the directors of admissions and university relations and marketing, alumni relations, fundraising, all of them report to the same vice president gives you a synergy that, that might not be as, as strong where we all divide it up in different um, divisions. So. so you're all kind of working for a common goal. We are, we <laughs> are. And one of those goals, PR and marketing, is that we be better known, that we have greater name recognition, our mm -hmm. brand be better understood and, and recognized, and, and so we're working as a team to make that happen. Okay. Now you mentioned alumni, and of course we have Absolutely. a lot of your alumni. <laughs> and, That's right. And so a lot of alumni throughout the region, but I imagine if you look at a map, we're spread throughout the country as well. We Missouri are spread South. throughout the country. Now you look at our past history of where we were Mm -hmm. uh, we're very heavy uh, within 100 miles of Joplin right. and that's where our alums tend to settle but yes you could go to any major city and, and find a, a lion tucked away in San Francisco or Dallas or, or uh, Bangor Maine so and alumni a lot of times people think well alumni graduate and they're just the people are going to go to to ask for money but you're asking for involvement from your oh, alumni absolutely. as well you know we often say that there are three stages to receiving a charitable gift and the very first one is communication mm -hmm. so a lot of folks will jump in we just need to go ask them for money well have we communicated with them what the institution's priorities are what our successes are how we're doing strategically are we growing are we becoming better known are we successful academically and athletically and culturally so communication is the first point of entry uh, with any stakeholder the next is engagement which you re referenced with right. alumni uh, having them come to an event and hear the president talk or uh, just see some of their fellow alumni and have a good time is oftentimes the tipping point between being receptive to an ask for a gift and saying, well, I haven't heard from you in years and mm -hmm. really don't know that institution anymore. We need to get them engaged and, and communicate with them before we ask them for money. So is that leading you to more outreach for alumni regionally? Absolutely. We're going to Kansas City. I see you go to Springfield, That's things right. like that. Well, and the, the Missouri Southern Foundation just passed their annual operating budget and they mm -hmm. invested a, a very nice uh, budget line in alumni engagement and encouraging the Office of Alumni Relations to continue to have nice events on campus, right. but to go to Kansas City, to go to Denver, to go to Dallas, to go to places where we have high concentrations of alumni, Northwest Arkansas, mm -hmm. and to engage them. 
uh, and really the era of the chicken and rice pilaf dinner in a hotel ballroom is over. <laughs> you really have to engage them in activities that they are either going to already be there mm -hmm. uh, or they have a desire to attend. And so we do a lot of baseball games. We do a lot of uh, festivals in communities. For example, uh, we're very present at Third Thursday. Right, here because there's already a high concentration of Missouri Southern alumni at Third Thursday, mm -hmm. we just take the opportunity to engage them where they are. Um, so it's very exciting. And of course, Third Thursday is something I know in the past, Missouri Southern's had an evening where it's kind of right. become Southern Night at Third it Thursday. Is, and we'll do Coming it again, up again this, year. this year. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So people can go down and you're really kind of just everywhere you turn, you should see Missouri Southern. You should, and even if it's not our night, mm -hmm. you should see us there. We should be very visible. Uh, certainly it's a community-wide event, right. and we want to honor that and not be overbearing, uh, but we should always be present at things like Third Thursday because that's where our constituents are themselves located mm -hmm. so they're living here they're doing those things so That's visit right. them as well right. <laughs> so um challenges we've talked a little bit about you know the fundraising aspect and the challenges uh your area of big responsibility not only as vice president but you also have the foundation role of you know bringing that funding sources to That's the right. university well and fundraising is a university activity that's mm -hmm. often a misunderstood nuance of this whole uh, uh enterprise Fundraising is a university enterprise. The receipt and the investment and the disbursement of those funds once they are given is a foundation. Okay, activity. so that's how you kind of set those apart. Right. And, and so you do differentiate them because you do want the institution to have clear oversight of what we're raising money for. Okay. And so having the fundraising be a university activity, the Board of Governors, the President, the, the administration has a very clear prerogative in setting the agenda for what we're raising money for. Mm -hmm. Once the money is received, the foundation takes over and invests it and disperses it on behalf of the donors. So. Yeah. Well, fundraising successes, and when people just drive past campus now, they see a new uh, facility going up at the football field. There's That's a new right. turf at the football field. There's, you've had it's some. It's not all at the football field. <laughs> no, so, yeah, but there yeah. are other places you're kind of, right. you know, people are investing in the university. You know, there's problem programs going on with biology coming up and so forth. Well, and I, I think in modern higher education, you could just about look at any part of the campus, and there's going to be a private fundraising component, mm -hmm. whether you realize it overtly or not. Uh, private money plays such a critical role that it it is integrated itself into every aspect of the institution. And so you might not realize it, but a, a professor teaching class that you would assume is fully supported by the state may be supported by an endowed professorship that pays a portion of his or her salary from a private donor. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly you could almost point to any student and have a 50-50 shot of hitting a student that's benefiting from a private scholarship. And so I think there are many, many instances where private money is critical to the success of the institution. It's just not widely known that, that uh, that that's the case. It's easy to point to a new facility mm -hmm. or something big and public and, and grand and say, oh, obviously public money was involved in that. Even the smallest details of university life, there's typically a private component. So that's where you're vis visiting, reaching out to people right. to be able to support. And I, the, I, from what I see, the way of reaching out to people has changed over the years. In the past, people say, oh, they have a phone-a-thon once a year. They call you and that's ask right. you for money. <laughs> well, and, and the traditional methods are still very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, for major gifts, gifts over $10,000, face-to-face uh, -face meetings with donors in their living rooms and their offices is still the most effective way of, of closing gifts of that size mm -hmm. because it really is about a relationship. Uh, if someone picked up the phone and called me and said, uh, hi, this is the Clark County Humane Society and we'd like for you to give us $10,000, well, I'd say, well, I don't make those decisions over the phone. I don't know you. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. uh, We sit in their living room. We sit in their office. We engage their spouse and their families. Uh, we make it a much more comprehensive relationship uh, at that major gift level. But for smaller gifts, we still do the phone-a-thon and we, right. we do some uh, more uh, technology-driven, trendy ways to raise money. And uh, I think we've talked about uh, crowdfunding. Right, so explain, yeah. tr explain crowdfunding. People are watching and they say, well, I've heard of that and Missouri Southern's gonna do it. How does that work? Missouri for Southern is going to be the first school in the MIAA to do crowdfunding. And that is a really a grassroots effort to raise money from individuals that you might not be other, otherwise able to reach. Mm -hmm. uh, let's use the example of the steel drums for the music department. Right. We had a donor that stepped forward and made that possible, and, and that was very, very generous and, and appreciated. But let's say we didn't have a donor um, identified to raise $30,000 for new steel drums. Well, we would put it on the crowdfunding website. We would create a short three-minute video about the need for 
the steel drums, and then we would ask music majors and uh, to give us the names of, of their family and their parents and their friends. We would go to the Alumni Association and say, can you give us the names of all the music majors? And we would begin to have this grassroots funding effort that would drive people to the crowdfunding website. Mm -hmm. They'd watch the video and they would make relatively small gifts, but you get thousands of people making a $20 gift or a $10 gift. And before you know it, you have the money you need to buy the steel drums. We're not going to have access to all those donors through traditional mechanisms, but when mm -hmm. you have the music department, the music alumni, the current music students, their families getting engaged from a grassroots perspective, you very quickly come up with the money you need for whatever the initiative is. So social media really plays a big role. It in is all doing. driven by social media and video. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you think back to the beginning of websites, right. you put text on the website, people went to the website they read, and then they left. Well, now it's much more about engagement. And so really our websites are more heavily populated by videos. Uh, and in the future may not have very much text at all, but will be little mini TV stations where folks go to get information about a particular item or issue. And crowdfunding is, is an example of that. You will watch the video. You'll see the case being made mm -hmm. for the need for the steel drums. And you'll decide at what level you wish to support that. And so really it's interacting more it with is. those websites. People yeah. are more than just a passive reader of information. That's they right. want to listen, they want to see what's happening. That's right. So those types of trends yeah. and tying that together. And crowdfunding nationally has been very successful. We're excited mm -hmm. to try it. Uh, we have a couple of pilot projects that have been identified across campus that we mm -hmm. will begin with this fall. Uh, but I can very easily see that being a, a mainstream mechanism for raising projects between ten and, and thirty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars in the coming years. Um, through crowdfunding. And this allows people, it sounds like, that may not have the big bucks in the bank to give, but sure. I'll give you $20 to help you out. That's what I can afford this you know, time you're asking. Well, whatever, and, and individuals that give you $20 now may very well be the $10,000 donors in 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. If you stick with them, you treat them well, they enjoy their experience, they're engaged, uh, you continue to communicate with them, you could very easily translate that into much larger gifts in the future. Now you've used the word communication quite a bit, so that sounds like it's a key aspect of your role and your Absolutely. staff's role. That is, you know, we need to let people know what we're doing and listen to them as well. That's right. And you can never communicate too much. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about everything from the traditional newsletters and the university magazine to the website to one-on-one -on -one communication. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no end to the need for communication with our stakeholder groups, whether they be local or national, uh, former students, current students, prospective students. In on campus faculty and staff, uh, it's endless. Mm -hmm. And the need for it is constant. And I think that's what drives most of our time is communication. Because again, to ask you to attend Missouri Southern as a student, to ask you to make a gift, to ask you to become engaged, to serve on a board, to do any of those things that add value to the institution, unless you feel like you're engaged from a communication perspective, they fall on deaf ears. Yeah. And so we do spend a lot of our time on communication. Now, I know um, KGCS is recording a series about senior citizens, and that brings up the fact that it's been said that there's a lot of wealth in today's senior citizens That's in right. society, and a lot of families or seniors are looking at estates and trusts and so forth. Is this also a trend that you're seeing in oh, uh, raising funds for universities? I have been in higher education for 20 years, and they were talking about the great transfer of wealth 20 years ago, and they're still mm -hmm. talking about it today, and it's very relevant. Uh, those folks that were baby boomers uh, after World War II or even the very early um, um, uh, or um, the silent generation of World War II and baby boomers right. are aging to the point that they are making their estate plans and they are uh, maturing and ready to make those lifetime gifts. If you're not on top of that, if you're not communicating, to use that word again, right. engaging them, building relationships, and being ready to make the case for why Missouri Southern is a good place to make that lifetime investment, you're going to get left out of that because I guarantee you every other nonprofit in the world is talking as well. So every and school they've ever attended, every group every, they've ever supported. <laughs> that's right. If they've ever written a check to a humane society in Montana, mm -hmm. they're getting calls to, to make that their charity of choice. Uh, one of my goals here locally is to make the Missouri Southern Foundation one of the top two or three charities of choice. That it's the first of mind, top of mind when you think of making a gift, having an impact, uh, investing in the future, you think about the Missouri Southern Foundation and Missouri Southern State University. That's not easy to do because certainly there are lots of voices out there. Right. Everyone's church, everyone's nonprofit, everyone's favorite uh, volunteer opportunity, they're all raising money. And so we have to be on our game and very aggressive, uh, in, in, not in a, an off-putting sense, but very mm -hmm. aggressive strategically uh, to be that charity of choice. So going over to the foundation side of things, once you receive those funds, That's right. then you in turn work with the university in dispersing them, as you said, to students, to programs. That's right. To 
everything we do is dispersed back through the institution. So mm -hmm. whether it's a scholarship, it's, it's support for an endowed professorship, it's uh, support for the construction of a new facility, it all flows back through the institution. Uh, so our relationship with the business office is very good and with uh, Rob Use, the Vice President for uh, Finance and Administration. But the Missouri Southern Foundation is governed by a 15-member, all-volunteer board of directors. Mm -hmm. No university staff members are on that board. They make decisions on investment and disbursement based on donor wishes and what's best for the donors and for the institution. And so again, relationships. Right. We have to make sure we have very good relationships with those 15 board members because they're making the decisions on behalf of the donors. And the donors can specify, I want Absolutely. this to help such and such a department or and these types of students. we have to follow through on it, yes. <laughs> and so those promises. To the letter. <laughs> they need to follow. That's right. And the money that you are getting, I know that we have endowed scholarships or endowed uh -huh. chairs, that money is kept and keeps earning itself to help continue to pay for programs. Well, and the investment committee has an obligation. Uh, we take 5% a year mm -hmm. uh, from those endowments to provide the scholarships to students or to provide the funds to the, the university. We have to be making... 5% plus inflation to mm -hmm. offset for growing costs, plus above that to reinvest in the endowment and, and make it grow itself over time. And so the pressure on the investment committee to realize rates of return in the 8, 9, 10% range consistently over time is huge. And those folks take it very, very seriously, but uh, we can't have an off year. Right. Uh, we're still going to spend the 5%, but we have to make sure that we have what's called intergenerational equity, mm -hmm. that those endowments grow at a rate that they're production in 50 years will be just as meaningful as it is today. And that's our responsibility at the foundation. So the foundation board of directors are people who are giving their time to do this type of that's research right. and helping you out. That's right. Okay. And, and I, as, as the executive director of the foundation, don't make any unilateral decisions on investment or disbursement. Mm -hmm. We are either doing our best to maximize the money we have or we're following donor wishes and intent. And so there's very little latitude in, in uh, making those decisions. That's why those foundation board members are so critical. And I know you have a website that you know, oh, people, you know, everybody on the campus has a website. That's so right. if people have questions, you know, what's the foundation? What can we do? Sure. You, on your webpage, you give them a lot of that basic information. We do, and there's contact information as well. And so mm -hmm. if something isn't answered for a particular uh, individual, they're encouraged to call us, and we're happy to have that conversation with them. Every donor will approach charitable giving from a different perspective because it's mm -hmm. not cookie cutter. It's very personal. It's, it's funds that you have worked hard over time to accumulate right. and you want to make sure they have the biggest impact. And so there are no cookie cutter gifts, whether it's a $25 gift to the Phonathon or a multi-million dollar lifetime gift to establish the, a center or, or an academic school or college. Those are very personal and that's why they take nurturing and relationship building and, and uh, really a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the donor by the development staff. You feel that sometimes it's a challenge and people want action now. You have to explain that it takes time to get things done like this. It does, and, and action now is one element of it. And also, we're entering a phase with donors where they want to be uh, informed about the impact of the gift. Mm. I think when I first began 20 years ago, uh, philanthropic individuals would write checks, and they would hand you the check and say, we trust you. Uh, go spend it the way you see fit. Well, now we're seeing donors restricting their gifts uh, much more aggressively, but also they want reports. They want to know what have you done with those funds to advance the institution. Uh, it's not a write a check and walk away situation. We spend mm -hmm. a, a lot of time interacting with donors and, and communicating. One of the things we're doing new this year are endowment reports, uh, where every donor that has an endowment will get a report on what their endowment earned, mm -hmm. how it benefited the institution, the names of the students they helped, uh, the ending balance, the investment performance because there's a much greater emphasis on accountability now than there was 20 years ago. Almost treating it like their bank statement. You know, they do, they absolutely. Know <laughs> and they pick up the phone as soon as they get those endowment reports and say, wait a minute. And you have to explain, well, this is how the investments worked. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But at least they can put their mind to rest and know that the funds they've gifted are in good hands. Now, I know something you did this past spring also was a chance for the donors of the scholarships to meet the students who receive them. That uh, was wonderful. That face-to-face -face interaction. Well, you give a gift that's supposed to benefit students, mm -hmm. and it just makes sense that we would connect you with the individuals that are benefiting from your generosity. And so the looks on the donors' faces when they sort of round a corner and, and they see the name tag and it has the student's name and it has their scholarship name on it, and they, their eyes light up, and just this immediate connection between the donor and the recipient of the generosity was really exciting. Mm -hmm. We'll do that every That'll year. That'll be a tradition to continue. It will, <laughs> absolutely, yes. What about from the student's perspective, that they have a name or face to identify with that scholarship that they've received? Well, and you're really planting the seed that in the coming years when they are financially able to make such a gift, mm -hmm. that they will understand the benefit, they will connect to the fact that the scholarship I received came from that person. Right. That person wrote a check 
that eventually came to me in the form of a scholarship and I benefited. I was able to complete my degree or go on a overseas trip or have an internship, do something special because an individual invested in the institution. And so it is priceless for us to plant that seed of philanthropic responsibility in today's graduates. And of course, today's students, we hear so much about the challenges of the debt load, the That's student right. loans and so forth. So helping those students get their start in their career without maybe having quite as much debt as when That's they graduate. Right. Those private scholarships mitigate that debt load, uh, but it also creates in the students a sense of awareness mm -hmm. of what it took to mitigate that debt load. So, yeah. yeah. So when we look at the overall structure of Missouri Southern and the finances, you mentioned the Vice President of Finance, the, the big scheme of the picture with the administration, you have to kind of put all the pieces together. As you, what can we do to make Missouri Southern succeed? You're Where right. are the pieces that need to be filled to meet the gaps? The well, and I think you or, or other uh, folks listening would be fascinated to hear the conversations at President's Council because we do all come not only with our own offices that we, we lead, uh, mm -hmm. their view, their bias of, of a situation, but we come thinking of the institution as a whole. And they're very interesting conversations where we collectively try to solve issues, maximize the impact on the institution, create strategies that will improve the quality of the educational experience for students here. Uh, it is really a very fascinating conversation and, and uh, I always look forward to Monday mornings. Uh, they're long meetings, but you get the, the four vice presidents and the president in a room and you begin to tackle some very complicated issues and you really do end up with good outcomes. So a lot of dreams that people say, you know, behind the scenes, a lot of goals and dreams. A for lot the of future. goals and dreams and, and a, just a lot of vision. It, mm -hmm. It's fun to listen to folks talk about um, what they could do with, with an issue or, uh, you know, for example, we have the FEMA shelter. Right. And it was designed for a very specific purpose. It's there to house students and, and uh, other individuals in times of, of weather emergencies but it's also there throughout the rest of the year and, and so we had a conversation about what else could we do with it. Mm -hmm. Well now it, it's known as the pavilion and we're going to begin leasing it out for events and, and as long as they don't interfere with our ability to serve the safety needs of our students, right. why wouldn't we do that? But that came out of one of those strategic conversations where a lot of big ideas and vision for the institution found its way into a very interesting solution for a niche facility on campus. It's something we haven't had in the past. That's right. They haven't been able to put That's that right. together. Universities can never have too much event space and opportunities to engage the public. Mm -hmm. Again, we want to get folks out here on campus, and so if a local bank wants to have a shareholder meeting, right. please come to Missouri Southern and have it here in one of our facilities because while they're here, they'll build a greater awareness for the presence of the institution. So you invite people to come see Missouri Southern. Anytime. Come visit. And come Anytime. Visit and come you need a studio audience. Right. That would be a great opportunity to engage people. <laughs> no, people yeah. are, well, the people a who are watching audience. out there on camera, they there can't you see go. us. <laughs> so, so your goals as vice president, if you, someone were to summarize, what would you like to, your main accomplishments? I certainly have some key areas of responsibility in enrollment management mm -hmm. and in fundraising and in brand recognition for the institution. So when I think about where my focus is, it's in admissions and, and fundraising okay. and, and uh, communication and engagement. Um, personal goals for me, certainly we have a long history of success in those three areas, but those are areas you can't rest in. It, it's a what have you done for me lately world. Mm -hmm. And so increasing what we did last year in admissions and, and fundraising and, and increasing brand recognition, uh, those are things that consume me every day and consume the team. And, and uh, we are here to support the strategic goals of the institution. And we do that best when we improve the, the quality and the effectiveness of those three areas. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you for visiting with us and sharing some information for our audience. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us this week on Newsmakers. I'm Judy Stiles. Hope you can join me again next week at the same time on this station. We'll see you then.